Hello guys and welcome to my first video game tutorial on the channel. And as you can see from the title, coding retro snake game from Nokia 3310 era. This game brings so much nostalgia and has a lot of warm memories in my mind. Playing with friends or during sections in university. And thanks to these retro pixelated games that I got into programming and computer science in the first place. Now I know there are a lot of cool YouTube video tutorials on Snake, but I'm going to give you my Retro Snake version, which I believe does not exist on YouTube, so it's gonna be fun. Also I'm going to explain every code line and code block to the best of my ability. And by the end of this tutorial, you will gain a lot of knowledge on the structure of a simple 2D video game. And this by the way could be the first step to create numerous amount of simple 2D games leading you to study and eventually be a game developer one day. Who knows? The game itself will be composed of three files, index.html, styles.css and snake.js. HTML and CSS will take maybe 20% of the tutorial, while the remaining 80% are dedicated to JavaScript. And trust me, it's going to be very educational and fun in the same time. And also we're going to push the code to GitHub and through GitHub we're going to deploy the game online so you can show it to your friends and feel free to improve upon it. Adding more game functionalities is a great way to excel in game programming journey or if you're looking to build a career as a game dev. Now let me show you a demo of the game and what we're going to be building today. Now you can see that the screen has this greenish color uh, like the one on the retro Nokia 3310. And this is our grid, so this is the whole canvas and this is the grid itself. Then you have a start game, you can click on that and start playing. So you can see that it has sound effects. We can pause the game by hitting spacebar. You can resume the game by hitting uh, spacebar again. And you can see that uh, the snake can go through the canvas, so from right to left or from top to bottom. And when it hit itself, the game is over and it will display a final score. And if you want to play again, you can click on the again button, which will restart the game. Also notice that when the snake eats one gem, its color changes to yellow. So that's a touch that I tried just to add to improve upon the game a little bit visually and as I said feel free to improve upon the game, uh, fork the game, submit your commits and I will review them and yeah no problem at all or if you want to do that on your own be my guest I have no problem with that but just you can credit my name on, um, on the game build itself. So yeah, this is our game guys. Also we're going to do the programming for the touch screen so you can play it on your smartphone. You can see me here playing on my Redmi Note smartphone and everything is smoothly working with the, the sounds are working perfectly except of course for the spacebar which doesn't exist on your smartphone. But other than that no lagging or anything. This part is going to be exclusive only to channels members. Now with that being said, let's go ahead and start coding. Alright, so let me first go uh, very quickly to uh, the folder where I want to code my game in. So you can create your own folder. This is a very good way to keep your code organized inside a folder, a main folder for your games, another folder for your uh, web app projects, for example, and so on. So uh, I'm going to create a folder, I'm going to call it games. And here uh, I will create this snake folder, right? So CD snake. Now let's quickly create a readme.md file and see what we're going to do. So as we said, um, our game structure here, we're going to have this index.html file. We're going to have the styles.css for the coloring and fonts and everything. And finally, uh, the 80% of the time, we're going to spend with snake.js. Now, snake.js itself is going to have um, different sections, all right? So this video is going to be um, organized into different sections inside snake.js. So you'll understand um, what exactly are you doing? Not only just 
you know, copying the code or typing the code and it's working. Um, this is not my intention. My intention is to divide the game itself, the, the logic itself inside your JavaScript file into different chapters. And inside each chapter, you will have clear explanation. So um, we're going to have our variables, declaration, initialization, chapter B uh, concerns the sound effects and HTML elements in game document. Chapter C concerns the event listeners. Chapter D uh, concerns the start and end functions. So we're going to create start function and end function for the game. Chapter E concerns the game loop. That's a very important part of any video game in general, the game loop. Number six or the F chapter concerns the um, the keys and touches. So the keys concerns your computer version and the touches concerns your um, smart smartphone. And this is going to be for the members, as we said. Now the last chapter, chapter G concerns gems, sneak drawing and collision detection. So collision detection is a very important part of any video game in general. All right, guys, so this is our general structure for our snake game. Now let's go ahead and start creating our index.html file. We'll move on, on styles.css and then we're going to spend the rest of the video with snake.js. All right, guys, so I'm inside my Visual Studio code. The first thing that I want to do is to create index.html. Also, I want styles.css and snake.js. As we said, we're going to start with index.html and I'm going to try not to take too much time in index.html and styles.css because you know, I presume that everything is going to be very basic, very simple, very understandable, even for those who have basic knowledge in HTML and CSS. Okay, so let's have a boilerplate, just call it snake. We're going to link the styles.css file and script source uh, snake.js file. Now, the most important thing in our HTML file is the canvas. The canvas is the page where we're going to draw everything, the snake, the gems, the logic, the style, everything. OK, so um, we need this element in our HTML file. Now I'm going to give it um, an ID and uh, the ID, I'm going to give it a name of game. So the canvas has an ID of game. Um, but the dimensions, we need to precise them. So it has a width of 400 pixels and have height of also 400 pixels. And that makes the canvas a square shape. So um, that's as far as the canvas. Also, I will need a button and uh, I'm going to give it that a class of start hyphen button. And this button is going simply to say start. Just you click on the button and the game is started. Um, also, I want to have a div. This div is going to have a class of game hyphen over. And that's essentially going to be the same button, but one for starting the game and one for restarting the game when the game is over. So uh, here uh, I'm going to have an H2 tag saying game over whenever the game is over, whenever the snake hits itself. Also, I will need a paragraph and inside the paragraph, I will uh, just display the score. So to display the score, I'm going to have a span with a class of um, score hyphen display. And of course, I'm going to use this class in my JavaScript file in order to dynamically insert the score that you have so far or the score that you had until the game is over. Um, initially is going to be zero. Right. Uh, but yeah, we're going to use this score display class in our JavaScript file. Um, also, I will need another button and it's going to have the same start button class name. So start hyphen button and here we're going to 
just type again. Um, by the way, I forgot to copy the two MP3 files. Uh, we're going to push everything to our GitHub repo. So if you're watching this tutorial and you want to clone this repo, you're going to have the MP3 files. Let me just grab them real quick. So the first file is eat.mp3. Okay. And the other file is call or collision. Okay. Whenever the snake hits itself. So I will need two audio tags here. Uh, the first one with ID collision sound. And uh, the source is going to be this call.mp3. And I will need another one for the eating sound, you see, eat.mp3. And I'm going to call it um, eating sound. All right, this is as far as the HTML. So this is what we have so far. Um, now let's go ahead and type some CSS code. So the first thing that I need is the font. The font that I want to use is called press start 2 p um, Let's go to Google Fonts. I need uh, press start 2 p So you can see that I have this already. There will be a button where you can add this. Okay, anyway, uh, here on the side, you will have this bar right here. And you want to go to import, you just do it like that. You want to go to this at import and copy this without the style tags. Right? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this right here, copy that and paste it here. Now I want to do some styling on HTML and the body. I'm going to have a height of 100%. Margin of zero and background color of uh, I have this degree a 74 a one. Alright, great. Now for the body, I want some separate settings. So I want display to be flex, I want to also align items to the center. Okay, good. Um, I want to justify content to center as well. And I want the font family the font family press start to be. So this is for the body. As far as the canvas, uh, the settings here are going to be a bit special. So for the border, I want it to be two pixels solid. And we're going to give it this color 74 8 C 72. And let's give it a background. So the background here. Um, I'm going to give it some linear gradient to have this beautiful uh, graded colors, different shades or different uh, degrees of the green to show the shades from top to bottom. So um, let's do the first one is 8F B 58 A. That's the first. Next with the hexadecimal A7 D4. Uh, I think we have it. Yep. That's the second one. Um, the third one, ABC FA5. And the last one is also 8FB58A. Okay. And you can see that it has this beautiful linear gradient from bottom or from top to bottom. Um, next, I want to have a box shadow. And inset means that we're going to put the shadow or dropping the shadow from an outer to an inner. Okay, so uh, it's going to be the exact opposite if I'm going to change that to outset, for example. Okay, so um, the inset here, I need 0, 0, 50 pixels and RGB alpha. So red, green, blue, alpha, I'm going to make it black. Okay, so black being uh, zero and 255 being white. Okay, so we have zero, zero, zero. And the alpha here is 0 0.4. And the alpha is 0 0.4. So the alpha actually is a value between zero and one. So zero is fully transparent and one is fully opaque. Look, if we'll do it one, 
that's totally opaque and if we'll do it zero that's fully transparent also i want to show you if you would do outset here you see how it's come it's coming from outside to inside where you will do inset that's from inside to outside also uh, let's give it some border radius and i'm gonna give it 20 pixels so that's as far as the canvas now i want the button the button is going to be the um, start button class here and essentially the start button is going to be exactly the same uh, as the again button both buttons have the same exact properties even the logic in javascript will be the same so the font family i want it to be this press start to be so i'm gonna copy that also margin top we're gonna give it 60 pixels also let's uh, set the position to be absolute so you can see that the position of the element could be absolute fixed relative static sticky it says here that the box's position is specified with the top right bottom and left properties and these properties specify offsets with respect to the boxes containing block so this is going to be absolute relative to the whole container the whole canvas top property to be 50 percent and also I want left property to be set to 50%. Transform here to translate, translate minus 50%, minus 50%. Right, so those three lines actually are related or um, connected together. So top 50 and left 50, this actually a uh, picture grabbing the top left corner of the button and putting it right in the middle of the container. So both horizontally and vertically, of course. So that's why top and left. Now think of adjusting the position slightly by moving the button um, left by half of its own width and up by half of its own width. So minus half, minus half. And this is actually a very handy trick for centering uh, buttons or any other HTML element, regardless of its size. Now we need a background color. The background color, I'm going to give it this uh, 061138, this dark blue color. You can change to whatever color you want. And of course, the font color could be white, could be triple F, you know, as you want. Um, also, I want to remove the borders. I want to give some padding, so uh, top and bottom, I'm going to give it 10 pixels, and right and left, 20 pixels. So top and bottom, this is the, the space inside the element itself, right? So you can see here, top and bottom, 10 pixels, and right and left, or it's not clear like that. So top and bottom, 10 pixels, and right and left, 20 pixels. If you will do 20 and 20, can see the difference now um, from the four sides the distance is the same 20 pixels 20 pixels 20 pixels 20 pixels in short if you want the four directions to be um, the same length you can just do like that and it will do the same thing 20 pixels from the four directions right but i want it to be uh, 10 pixels up and or top and bottom 20 pixels right and left also font size cursor set to pointer some roundness border radius 20 pixels all right guys that's as far as the start button and the start button and the uh, again button are the same now as far as the game over here game hyphen over class i want to position that to be absolute top also I want it to be 50% left 50% as well so exactly like what we have done in the button transform translate minus 50% minus 50% text align to center so display is none and now the start has appeared because the start actually was uh, behind everything behind the again button so um, the moment that I have hidden everything or display or set the display to none, now the start button has, uh, has appeared again.
All right, guys, so this is as far as styles.css and index.html. Now let's go ahead and start coding in JavaScript. And as we have seen, uh, we have different chapters. So the first chapter we will have is the variable declaration or initialization. So yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and start coding our JavaScript file. Welcome back, guys. This is chapter one, declaration and initialization. So I'm going to use const keyword. The name of the variable is going to be canvas document dot get element by ID because we have an ID of game. Okay, so this line here actually gets a reference to the HTML canvas element in the HTML document that we have created. The next variable that I want to create or declare is context. All right, so context actually is going to retrieve the 2D rendering context of the canvas in our HTML. Okay, so I'm going to take the canvas, obviously, and there is a method called get context. And inside we're going to feed this get context method with 2D rendering. Actually, this line simply it's retrieving the 2D rendering context because we have a 2D video game. Next, also, I want a variable called grid and grid. I'm going to give it a value of 16 a simple integer. Simply, this is the, the game canvas, which is composed of 16 square cells. Okay, so uh, let me just show you real quick. I'm not very good in drawing, but um, let's say that this is our canvas, for example. Okay, so it will have 16 square by 16 square, right? Um, vertically and horizontally like that. So total we will have uh, 256 grid square. Okay, so these squares here or these cells here, each one is going to uh, represent an element inside our canvas or our grid rather, right? This is the grid. Right? And the whole page is the canvas. So inside our grid, we'll have 256 cells um, in which the snake is going to move and eating the gems. So I'm initializing actually the grid to be equal to 16. Horizontally and vertically multiplied by each other are going to give us 256 grid square cells. Um, also, I want count. So this count variable, by the way, is very important because it's going to help us creating the motion of the snake on the grid. So this is as far as the count. Also, I want um, a score variable also initially set to zero. I also want to keep track of the gem being eaten by the snake. So I need um, a variable called gem eaten. And that's going to be initially set to a boolean value, which is false. And finally, I want a variable called allowance counter, and that's going to be set to zero. The allowance counter is going to help me um, setting the color of the snake. Whenever it eats a gem, it turns to yellow for some time. And then after it turns back to black. So if you think about it, we need a snake object, right? So we need a snake object variable. So I'm going to create the snake object. And this snake object is going to hold different key value pairs. The first key is going to be the X coordinates and I'm going to set it to also the Y. I'm going to set it to 160. I need the velocity of the snake on the horizontal axis DX. And that's going to be equal to the full or the whole grid. So if the snake has a horizontal velocity on the X axis, the Y or the uh, vertical axis should be set to zero. Also, I need a cells array. So that's going to be an empty array initially. And finally, maximum cells, which is the maximum number of cells of the snake. So the snake is composed of four cells. And every time the snake eats one gem, the amount of the cells inside the snake's body increases by one. So this increase in the amount of cells inside the snake's body is going to be stored inside that cells array. Also, I need a gem object. So we have a snake object and we have a gem object. And also it will have um, the X coordinate 
320 and y coordinate is 320. All right, so this is as far as the gem. Now what I want to do next, still in this chapter, that I want to create a function that it's going to generate random integers. These random integers actually are going to be substituted by the gems in order to randomly generate gems inside the grid itself. So whenever the snake eats one grid in one place, another one's going to be generated in a different place automatically. So let's see this function and how we can create it. I'm going to use the function keyword. The name of the function I'm going to say get random int is going to take an input of min max. So minimum number and a maximum number. So between 0 and 25, I want to create a random number, then what it will return actually is the math class here. And inside the math class, there is a method called floor. This floor is going to take again, the math class taking another method called random. And that's the core of this function, it returns a number between zero and one. But as we are creating here, our, you know, uh, own customized um, function that can take any number that we want. So later, you can do get random int and you can do for instance, zero and 25, for example. Okay, and you will invoke it and it will work. But let's just continue what we're doing. So math dot random, we need to invoke this function or this method rather. Um, that's going to be multiplied by the max minus the min. And finally, we add it to the minimum or the, the least number. All right, guys, so in the next chapter, we're going to see how we can integrate sound effects. And also we can create more HTML elements variables. All right, guys, so welcome back to chapter two, sound effects and HTML elements. Before we get started in chapter two, there is a very important point that I want to make sure that you understand perfectly. So we have here the coordinates of the snake, which is 160 on the x axis and 160 on the y axis. Also, we have 320 and 320 for the x and y axis for the gym. Okay, so now you might ask, so you have a grid with 16. This is not pixels. These are square cells. So our canvas, if you remember, it has 400 pixels in both width and height. Okay, so uh, this is your world. The pixels are not the square cells. So you have in total 256 square cells, and you have uh, dimensions 400, uh, 400 pixels for the height and 400 pixels for the width. They are two different things. And let me quickly show you if we will change the number of pixels inside HTML. Let's make it for instance, 600 for the width and give it 600 pixels also for the height. You can see that the number of pixels of, of the canvas itself has increased. So this is very important not to confuse between the number of pixels given here, which are 600 by 600, and the number of square or the grid square cells. Okay, let's get back to our JavaScript file and start chapter two. And the first two variables that I want to create in this chapter concern the collision sound and the eating sound. And that's self explanatory. I want just to take the ID of that HTML element collision sound, and the eating sound here, right, and link them in our JavaScript file. And by the way, a very good practice in your JavaScript projects, um, keep your const or at least that's the way that I do. And I see it the best practice, but you know, you can disagree with me. What I do actually is I keep the const above and the let here below the const keywords and the let keywords. Both of them are used to declare variables, of course, as you may know, the main difference between both is that const is used to declare variables with constant values that cannot be reassigned. However, the let keyword here is used for variables with mutable values that can be reassigned. So they are more dynamic than the const keyword. 
Okay, so you, if you want to reassign the value of that variable, you can use or you should use, I would say, the let keyword, right? So this is the difference between the const and let if you didn't know, but I think you know the difference. Anyway, let's go ahead and create those two variables for the sound. So um, I'm going to say here const uh, collision uh, collision sound is equal to document dot get element by ID and the ID for the collision sound is collision sound actually so let's just take that here you know programmers are lazy they tend to copy paste things so yeah um, do the same thing here eating sound and also I think it was called eating sound Later, we're going to use those two variables here, the collision sound and the eating sound in order to display or activate the actual sound when there is a collision, when the snake hits itself or when there is uh, eating of the gym, when the snake eats the gym. OK, next, I want two different let keywords. So uh, let's just put them. Let's just put them here above one when the game is running and one when the game is paused. So that's self-explanatory. I'm just going to set the first one to false and also the second one when the game is paused. I'm going to set it initially to false. The next variable that I want to create is a very important one actually. And that's going to be initially assigned to be used later. I'm going to call it animation frame. The animation frame here is a very important one. Why? Because it's going to be a store. It's going to be used as a store for the ID that it's returned by a method called a request animation frame. This request animation frame method is going to be fed with the loop function the main game loop function. So basically what it does, it calls itself very, very fast. So it's actually giving you the illusion on the on the screen that there is a motion or movement. But in fact, what it does, it repaints or redraws everything on the canvas very, very fast, giving you this illusion of motion or movement. So whenever the snake is moving, it's actually being repainted very quickly. And you can take the same concept and measure it on larger scales. So you have games on PlayStation, for example, or your Xbox or computer games in general, right? You have this 60 frames per second. The more frames per second are being displayed or rendered on the screen, the more the game is smooth and being played almost naturally, right? There is no lagging. The movement is very smooth, looks very natural because the amount or the number of frames being played sequentially per second is very high. All right. So that's a very important thing to understand in video games in general, in 2D video games and of course in 3D video games. The concept of FPS or frames per second is a very fundamental one in order to understand games programming. And later we're going to see uh, this request animation frame method and the ID generated when we feed this function, the loop function, actually. So it calls itself very, very quickly. And inside the loop function is everything. Painting the gems, painting the, the, the snake, um, the number of frames, the number. That's why we used here the count, which is initially set to zero, right? And by the way, this count here is set initially to zero, but we're going to set it to a higher number. And a higher count number means that repainting the snake itself very quickly. So if I will set the count, for example, here to 90 or 95 or 100, that means that the loop function is going to repeat itself very quickly, 100 times, you know, then and only then you will have the illusion that the snake is moving up, down, right and left. So animation frame is a very important one and very important concept to understand. And 
buttons. Um, I believe the class for the start button is start button. Yep. So start hyphen button. Also, I need the one for game over screen. So this one is um, game over. Okay. And the last one is score display. And that's score display here. All right. All right, guys, so this is the end of chapter two. In the next chapter, we're going to set up the event listeners. All right, guys, welcome to chapter three, where we're going to set up the event listeners. So in the beginning of the tutorial, we have said that we have two things or we have two ways of setup, one for the computer and one for your smartphone. For the smartphone, this part, I'm going to leave it out of the tutorial now. I'm going to keep it as exclusive content for the members of the channel. Now let's go and do the computer part with the key strokes. So let's get down here below under the get random int function. Let's do a quick comment event listeners for the computer. All right, so this part actually is going to be an event listeners attached to the key down event on our document object. So um, I want to grab the document and add an event listener. The event listener is going to listen to a certain event, which means a certain action from your side. In this case, it's going to be when your key is down or when the key is pressed. This is the event key down. And the second parameter of this add event listener method is a callback function. So this function takes an event as an input. And we are going to return based on different conditions. So we want to check out if the game is not running or game running is false. In other words, if game is not running or game is paused, if that's the case, we are going to return. So if game is not running, we are going to return, which means that the following code or the code that will follow this logic is not going to be executed. Otherwise, we are going to have different checking points. The first if condition here is going to take the event dot which method this is deprecated, but it's still working. If you happen to know a different property, use it, but which also still working. If e dot which is equal to a certain code number, this code number here is 37. So let me just give you the mapping for your keyboard or at least for the keys that we're going to be using in this tutorial. So you have 37 for left key, 38 for up key, 39 for right key, 40 for down key, and 32 for space bar key. But also we have a logical operator, which is and snake dot dx and the dx is the velocity of the snake. The velocity means not only the movement, but taking in consideration the direction as well. So the movement with the direction creates the velocity of the snake object. We have here the dx, which is the horizontal velocity on the x axis. If this is equal to zero, which means that it's moving whether up or down, right? Because if 
the x-axis is zero, that means that the y-axis is active. Otherwise, the vertical axis is active, up and down. So, in this case, I want to do two things. The first one, I want to set snake.dx to be equal to minus grid. And what that means that we are moving to the left on the x-axis. Because, let me show you again in Microsoft Paint here. So, we have our canvas here, okay? Then everything here starts on the top left corner. Starts with 0, 0.0, which means that's the x coordinates and that's the y coordinates. 0 and 0 starts here. So, whenever the object moves up or to the left, it decreases, it's by minus. And whenever it moves to the right or to the bottom, it's positive. All right, so whenever the snake is moving up, that means that it's decreasing on the um, y axis. And whenever it's moving to the left, which is our case now on key 37, the grid itself is going to be decreasing. Okay, so that's the whole idea of our canvas. And that's a very important thing also to understand. Canvas. All right, so back to our code. So here you can understand very well that snake.dx is equal to minus grid. Why? Because we are decreasing if the um, key itself is 37 and snake.dx is equal to 0. All right, another point to understand very well that snake.dx equals 0 means that snake.dy is not equal to 0, which means that it was moving upward or downward. So the moment that those two conditions are realized, snake.dx is going to be minus grid, which means that it should move to the left and apply the same concept on the three other directions. It's going to be exactly the same, but that's not all. We need also to set the snake.dy.dy to zero because it's moving simply on the x axis we need to lock the y axis and that right here is going to update the snake's velocity there is going to be a restriction on moving to the opposite direction because the dy is set to zero so whenever the um, dx is set to minus grid which means moving to the left or above right because we said minus is going to be either to the left or above that's code 37 and that's code 38 so for code 38 we'll have the same exact logic all right guys so this is very important to understand all right so i'm going to apply the exact same logic on the other three directions all right so those are the four directions that we have 37 38 39 and 40. The last event listener that we want to create is for posing the game or when we hit the space bar, the game is going to be paused. So um, let's just uh, come here down below and check out if e dot which is equal to 32. In this case, I want to set game paused equal to so game paused is false. So this line simply means that I'm going to toggle between both values. And this exclamation mark, by the way, that's a logical not. Okay, so um, this means not. So that's going to be toggled with the space bar. Whenever the game paused is true, when you will hit the space bar, the game pause is going to be false. So every time you hit spacebar, you pause the game, actually. You pause it and resume it. You pause it and resume it. This is the whole idea. All right, so uh, I want the color for the context, context.fill style, to be equal to triple F, that's white. 
context.font. I want it to be bold, three pixels, and Arial. And now I want to check if the game actually is paused. So if game paused is true, in this case, I want to display this message. And I'm going to say game paused simply. And where I want to put it in the center of the canvas. To do that, I'm going to take the canvas, I'm going to divide it by two minus 100. And then canvas dot height divided by two. That's the calculation simply of that message to be exactly in the center of the canvas. Else, I want to resume the game actually. How I can do that? Now, I want to take my animation frame and I want to request the animation frame and pass inside that loop that I didn't create yet. But here is going to be loop. And this loop function exactly what I told you about a moment earlier. Um, and that we will need to create, by the way, um, function loop. And here I want to check out if game running is not true. Otherwise, the game is paused using another logical operator, which is or. So if game running is false or game is paused, so game paused. In this case, I want to return, which means that I will not execute anything um, that comes after this code block if you will. And this behavior makes perfect sense because when the game is not running, there's typically no need to continue processing the game loop. This loop function here is being fed to that request animation frame. And this request animation frame calling on this loop function that it's calling itself actually, and having this ID stored inside that animation frame. So to put everything together, when this line of code is executed, it's going to schedule the loop function to be called on the next animation frame and effectively is going to resume the game loop and will allow the game to continue updating and rendering in a smooth and efficient manner. All right, so I hope everything is clear up until this point, guys. Please, by the end of the tutorial, if you found any difficulties understanding anything, let me know in the comment section below. I am very happy when I read your questions or feedback, even when I read sometimes some harsh comments. Um, that's fine if it's going to serve the purpose of educating everyone, including myself. That's absolutely fine. So please do not hesitate to ask any question that you want. And uh, yeah, I'm going to do my best to answer your questions, guys. So that's the end of chapter three. So far, we have declared and initialized some variables. We have created um, the HTML elements and the sound effect elements. Also, we have set up the event listeners on the key pressing for left, up, right and down and also the space bar to pause the game. In the next chapter, we're going to create two functions, start game and end game. Let's start by the start game function. Let's just get down here below under the uh, main loop function. And um, we are going actually to create our start game function. So this function basically is going to be responsible for running your game actually. Okay, so this is your motor. When you will click on the start button, this function is going to be invoked and actually triggered. So uh, let's start by saying function start game. That's the name of the function, of course. And uh, we're going to check if game is actually running, then we'll do nothing. Otherwise, we want to set some variables to some values. So the first variable that I want is the game running and I'm going to set it to true because the game in this case is going to be running. 
also the game paused, I want to set it to false, right? So game is not paused. Um, also, the score is going to be zero initially. The X and Y coordinates of the snake both are going to be set to 160. So snake dot X is 160 and also for the Y axis. Snake dot cells as well is going to be reset to an empty array. Snake dot maximum cells are going to be set or uh, return back to the default of four cells. So as I told you, the snake is going to have four cells. So this is basically our snake initially. And the more the gems that are going to be eaten, the more the number of the cells that are going to be added to the snake. Right? So with that, also the horizontal velocity of the snake is going to be equal to the whole grid and uh, vertically speaking is going to be equal zero. All right, so this is as far as the snake. So all of that concerns the snake, right? As you can see, the score, the game paused and game running. Now, what about the gem on the X and Y axis positions? So uh, if we will take the gem and the gem here has two different properties, the X and the Y. And initially, we have set the gems to, if you remember, 320 pixels. So our canvas has 400 pixels um, on the, um, the height and width. And the gem itself has default position on the X and Y axis for 320 pixels. Now, let's say that we want random X and Y positions. And that's going to be exactly the role of this function right here, the get random int. So inside the get random int, we're going to set a minimum and a maximum, and we will multiply it by the grid. And we will set gem.x equal to get random int. And we're going to set from zero to 25, for instance. And we're going to multiply that by the grid. Similarly, for the y axis, we're going to do exactly the same thing. And of course, when I will play, I want to remove anything from um, the grid or the canvas itself. So I don't want any buttons. I don't want the uh, score display to appear. So I will set the start button dot style dot display. I will set that to none. The same thing for the game over screen. So also, I want the text content of the score display to be equal the actual score. So score display dot text content is equal to the actual score. The last thing that we want to create in our start game function is to check if the animation frame is truthy. So if animation frame is truthy, and this is what I told you um, in the beginning or towards the beginning of the actual tutorial in chapter one or chapter two, I don't remember, when I told you that animation frame can be used actually to cancel any other animation frames. So this condition actually is going to check if this animation frame is active or truthy. Uh, this means that there is already a request for an animation frame in progress. And in this case, I want to cancel the current animation frame request. And this actually is done to prevent um, multiple animation requests from accumulating and causing potential performance problems or issues. So that's the main reason why we want to check if the animation frame is already active. And before we request another one, we should uh, cancel the animation frame first. So cancel animation frame in this case, and it takes inside this animation frame. And after canceling the previous animation frame here, I want to um, set a new animation frame to be requested. So I will set the animation frame to be equal to the request animation frame taking inside the loop which I showed you earlier. So this loop function right here 
this is going to be uh, specified as the callback to be executed when the browser is ready to repaint or re-render everything on the screen, right? So this is a recursive call. I spoke a lot about recursion in different videos. So um, this is a method or this is a function that calls itself uh, recursively. Okay, so it's going to be working forever, actually. Now we need to create our end game function and game function and I'm gonna call it um, end game right and here we're going to set the game running to be false because the game is over and the opposite thing the game paused is going to be set to true right that's quite logical also I want to show the game over screen so we're gonna set it to block game over screen dot style dot display to be set to block and finally I want to get that score display in the span to display the actual score so to do that I'm gonna say document dot query selector and I'm going to take both classes actually the game over game uh, oops game over and score display dot text content is equal to the actual score whatever the score is the score is going to be incremented every time uh, the snake eats a gem again we are going to cancel the animation frame because the game actually is paused or the game is over again i repeat this is very important guys so that's why i repeat it whenever i have the chance the game is over or the game is paused so there is no logic or no reason to let the animation frame running that's why we're going to cancel the animation frame taking inside the animation frame as an input so if animation frame is truthy I'm going to cancel animation frame taking inside the animation frame itself. So simply I am checking if the animation frame is active. I'm going to cancel it simply because the game is over. Now let's actually get here above. Um, let's get under the score display actually under under the get random end function. And I'm going actually to add two additional event listeners for start game and the um, the start button actually, right? So um, the first one is going to be for starting the game. So start game event listener start button here is going to uh, listen on an event and the event here is click so when you will click the start button we'll have a callback function that's going to return well let's see um, just for sanity check uh, let's do console console.log and let's say for instance um, button is clicked okay let's just do like that and let's get our game let me actually open the web dev tools all right let's get the console and let's see start and there we go button is clicked so i'm going to comment this line out and instead i'm going to invoke the start game method all right, so this is to start the game. I want to restart the game whenever the game is over, right? So restart game when game is over. So game over screen dot query selector. And here the class is the start button dot add event listener. And on click event, I want to and this callback function start game we're going to invoke the same exact function here so the start game function actually is going to start the game if the game is over 
or if the game didn't start yet. All right, so if we will check what will happen, the start button should disappear. So if I will click, yeah, good. All right, guys, so we are done with chapter four, start game and end game functions. In the next chapter, we're going to create the main game loop. Actually, we have started doing that. Let's get back here. If you remember when I wanted to explain to you the concept of if game running is false or game is paused, we will return because there is no point of doing anything if the game is not running or paused, right? So um, yeah, that was our introduction in the function loop. But if that's not the case, I want to set the animation frame. So basically it's going to be the same line to um, just let me just paste that first. So what happens here is that this request animation frame method tells your browser to call an animation function and repeat it very fast forever. That's why you have this illusion of motion on the screen. When the snake is moving, actually there is repainting very, very fast. You can, of course, um, control the speed of painting the snake, these cells, the four cells, the initial four cells of the snake. You're going to see later how they are moving. You can control that speed. And this is what I call the recursive mechanism because the loop is being called from within itself. All right, so I want to control the game loop speed. To do that simply, I will uh, come just here below and just add a comment control game loop speed. So here I want to check out if our count, if you remember our count, um, our count here was initially set to zero. I want to check out if it's below a certain number. And let's say this number is 100. I want also to return. I want to check out if this incremented count is less than 100. In this case, I want to return. Otherwise, I want to set the count to 95. But with the control game loop speed actually comes the uh, game logic and rendering of the snake on the screen. I want the context in order to clear the whole canvas. OK, and that's going to happen very quickly again, uh, painting and clearing and painting and clearing. And this actually is going to give you the illusion that the snake is moving. But what happens, in fact, is that you paint one cell and then removes it and then update your position uh, on the X and Y coordinates on the canvas for the new position and then removes it. You paint, you update the location, you clear. You paint, you update the location, you clear. All happens very fast inside your loop function. So I want to clear from the top left corner of the screen or the canvas. So this is actually on the X and Y coordinates from the top left. As I showed you here, if you remember, zero, zero. So from here, I'm going to clear everything, uh, taking in consideration the width of the canvas and the height of the canvas. Right, so let's continue doing that. So here I'm going to uh, pass actually canvas dot width and canvas dot height. And then I'm going to update snake dot x by the horizontal velocity and also by the vertical velocity. So that's going actually to update the new position of the snake on the canvas. All right, so I hope that all of those lines are clear to you guys. Next, what I want to do is that I want to update the snake cells and handle the collision, the collision of the gem with the snake and collision of the snake with itself. So what I want to do is that I want to determine where's the head of the snake on the canvas, which means that where's the direction of the snake. In order to do that, I'm going to take snake.cells and then JavaScript gives me a method called unshift. So you can see here it says that unshift method inserts new elements at the start of an array and returns the new length of the array. What that simply means that the unshift method is going to take an array of the X and Y positions of the snake's head. So the X here is set to snake.x and Y here is set to snake.y. So this line simply says that I want to add the position of the snake's head in front of the snake itself. Now, what I want to do is that I want to check out if the current length of the snake, which is going to be represented by the array of cells, 
is more than the snake.max cells, which is the four, uh, the four initial cells of the snake's body. Let's do that together. If snake.cells.length, so that's the current length of the snake, is more than snake.cells max cells which are the four initial cells of the snake's body in this case i want to say snake dot cells dot a method called pop pop is another javascript method that removes the last element from an array and returns it uh, we're going to remove the last cell from the array effectively to shorten the snake so what that simply means that we want to ensure that the length of the snake does not exceed the maximum allowed length, which is four. And if it does, it's going to trim the snake by removing the last cell from the array. And that's the job of the pop method. By that, we are actually maintaining the maximum length constraint. Now with that condition being fulfilled, I want to draw the gems and the snake now. I want the gem to be white. So context.fill style to be equal to the hexadecimal triple F. And also I want it to be rectangular shape. So fill rect uh, method, it's going to take the position of the gem on the X axis, the position of the gem on the Y axis. Also, I want the width and the height. So grid minus one and grid minus one. All right, so this line is to fill the rectangle, to shape the rectangle. So let's take a look if uh, we'll hit start. Cool, it appeared here, you can see, right? If um, we'll do refresh and hit start again, it randomly appeared uh, in a different location. Let's do that one more time. Now we have it here. So cool, great. Now for some visual flair, I'm going to add some shadow properties. Also, I want some blurness to this shadow. Also, I want shadow offset to be equal to two. Same thing for the Y axis. Next thing that I want to do is to create or draw the snake. So uh, drawing the snake and eating the gem. So here I want to take the snake dot the actual cells and I'm going to iterate or loop over using the for each method. So this method uh, is another JavaScript method that performs the specified action for each element in an array. And the array that we will have is an array of different cells. So this takes actually a callback function. So this callback function takes two different input. The first um, or the value here is the cell. And the number is going to be the index of that cell in the array. And then for each cell, I want to fill rectangle context dot fill rect. Again, we're doing this in a square shape taking in account the X position of the cell, the Y position of the cell, also grid minus one and grid minus one. Now for the collision detection, I want to check out and that's a lot of people think that collision detection is a very difficult thing. Well, in fact, it's a simple condition. We want to check if the cell dot X is equal to using the triple equal sign the gem dot x if that's the case but also the y position so cell dot y is equal to gem dot y in this case we would do the following we're going actually to let the snake eat the gem so snake dot max cells is going to be incremented by one cell and naturally, the score also is going to be incremented by one. And score display now dot text content is going to be equal to the actual score. This line here updates that score display by the actual score. Also, we want to add some sound effects if that condition is truthy. And we have that eating sound element dot a JavaScript method called play. And that, of course, is going to 
um, play that mp3 but what's most interesting after eating so let me just divide this a little bit here so snake eats gem uh, what happens is cells increase score increases and score display is being updated with the actual score all right and here playing eating sound but as i said the most interesting part here is that i want to generate a gym in a random position immediately after that the snake hits or eats that gem we're going simply to set the gem.x and we're going to call or invoke the get random int function that we have created earlier and then we're going to set a minimum and a maximum number so i want a number between 0 and 25 and that's going to be multiplied by the grid and similarly for the y position of the gym all right so let's check out what we have so far fingers crossed and we have a snake moving congratulations up left down and right now let's do the collision detection perfect the sound is being played and the gym disappears and the amount of the cells increases by that gem that's being eaten right great but notice that when i hit myself nothing happens actually also if it will go up it doesn't appear from below here from the screen so we're going to set the edges of the grid a bit later but perfect so far we have progress in the game now i want to change the color of the snake itself so let me just come here below it's not going only to be the color of the snake in the normal state but also it's going to be um, the color or the new color of the snake when it eats a gym um, the standard color is going to be um, greenish or dark greenish and when it eats the gym it's going to turn to yellow as you saw in the demo so to do that i'm going to set context dot fill style to be equal to a ternary operation so i'm going to check out if the gem eaten is truthy in this case i want that color uh, 4f00 so that's the yellow color and if the gym is not eaten uh, we're going to leave the normal color that we want to set for the snake right so let's save let's get back and there we go that's the greenish or dark color uh, now let's try to eat that gym it didn't turn to yellow okay mm, I think because uh, we have to set gem eaten to true um, let's try that gem eaten let's set it to true yay perfect but it stays yellow we don't want that i want it after a few seconds to be turned to black again all right so let's see if we can do that here above uh maybe before the animation frame i'm going to call it allowance period okay it doesn't do anything actually it's just changing of color the original idea that i had in my mind when i was coding this game is that i wanted it when the snake hits itself during this allowance period nothing can happen the game is not over so you would have an allowance of let's say five seconds the color of the snake turns to yellow and whenever the snake hits itself nothing happens it continue running normally but actually i didn't have the time to develop more in this feel free to improve upon this so that's a little homework for you so i want to check if the gym eaten is true i want the allowance counter to be incremented by one if you remember we have this allowance counter here uh, originally set to zero this allowance counter is going to be incremented by one also i want to check out if the allowance period is over or not so that's a very simple condition to check if the allowance counter is more than or equal to 50 that's an arbitrary number 
In this case, I'm going to set the gem eaten to false. And the allowance counter is going to be reset to zero. Right, let's try that one more time. All right, perfect. Black, yellow, and then black again. Of course, you can change the allowance counter period here to be more than 50. If you would do it uh, 100, for instance, the uh, allowance is going to be longer. All right, so remaining two things to do in the loop function. The first thing is to wrap the snake position on screen edges. So whenever the snake is going to go to the bottom, it's going to reappear from uh, the top. If it goes to the right, it will uh, reappear from the left. All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing is we want to check if the snake hits itself, we want to game over. All right, so let's see where we can do that. Uh, let's do it here, for instance, um, below updating the X and Y position by the velocity. So what I want here is to wrap the snake position on screen edges. All right, so that's again a very simple condition check. I want to check out if snake.x, if the, the position or if the X position of the snake is less than zero. And by the way, during this code block that we're going to write right now, do not forget what I told you uh, here, okay? If you're going to go up, you're going to decrease. If you're going to the left, you're going to decrease as well. If you're going to the right or to the bottom, you increase. If snake.x is less than zero, this means that I want the snake.x to be equal to canvas.width minus grid. Else if snake.x is more, more than or equal to canvas.width, in this case, snake.x is equal to zero. Here in the first line, I'm saying that if the snake's x coordinate is less than zero, in other words, it has moved off the left edge of the canvas, it's going to wrap around to the right edge by setting the snake.x to be equal to the canvas.width minus grid. And if the snake.x coordinate is greater than or equal the canvas.width, which means that it has moved off the right edge of the canvas, it's going to wrap around to the left edge by setting the snake.x to zero. And we're going to do the exact same thing, but for the y axis. So we're going to say if snake.y is less than zero, we're going to set the snake.y to be equal the canvas dot, in this case, height, because we're talking uh, vertically, not horizontally, minus grid, else if the snake.y is equal to or more than the canvas dot height, we're gonna set snake.y to zero. Again, the exact same logic. If snake.y, so if it's on the, uh, the exact, so if snake.y so if the y position of the snake is less than zero, we're going to set the position of the snake vertically to be equal to the height minus grid. So the whole height minus the grid to appear from below here. And if the position of the snake is equal to or more than the canvas dot height, which means that down here below, we're going to set the y position of the snake to zero. Yeah, so that's that. Let's actually check out what we have. Um, so that's the snake and there we go left appears to the right bottom appears to the top right appears to the left and left appears to the right all right perfect now the remaining thing in our loop function is whenever the snake is going to hit itself 
we're going the game to be over. So let's go ahead and work on that. So let's go back here down below and do um, check collision with snake's own body. Game is over. Right, so to do that, we're going to iterate over the length of the snake. So for that, I'm going to use a for loop. So for let i is equal to index plus one, unless the i is less than snake dot length, I want to increment the i or the iterator by one. So that means that I want to iterate over the cells inside the snake's body. And now we will have our condition. So if um, cell dot x is equal to using again the triple equal sign snake dot cells sub i the iterator dot x and the same thing for y. So cell dot y is equal to snake dot cells sub i dot y. We're going actually to invoke the end game method. And also I want to play the hitting sound. We're going to do the same thing as we did for the eating sound. So collision sound dot play to play the collision sound. All right, guys, so this is what you can do in order to check the collision uh, with the snake's own body. So basically you iterate through the cells of the snake starting from a certain index and then you can check out if the current position of the cell on the x coordinates is equal to the subsequent cell coordinates on both the x axis and the y axis. And if that is true, we're going to detect a collision here and we're going to end the game. And of course we play and of course we play the collision sound and of course we play the collision sound. All right, so let's go ahead and All right, so let's go ahead and try that. Okay. Now I'm not sure if it's long enough. Uh, nothing happens actually. Let's see why. For let i is equal to index plus one if the iterator is snake dot. Uh, huh. There is no length. No, I mean cells dot length. Snake dot cells dot length. Yep. Okay, so I apologize for that error. Uh, let's try that again. Fantastic. The game is over when the snake hit itself. One gem, two gems, three gems. Four gems. Now let's make a game over. Perfect. Final score four. So the counter is working perfectly. And if you'll click again, the game will restart. You know what? I realized that we haven't actually checked the pause. So if I will hit space bar, it paused the game, but it didn't actually display game is paused or anything. Again, uh, space bar, it resumes. Good. Now we are actually done with chapter five. Uh, we have created successfully our loop function. But uh, what's annoying me is the space bar here. So context.fill text, uh, why this is not being displayed? Oh yeah, I know why, because canvas.width, canvas.width and canvas.height, both are divided by two, but for the width, we decrease 100 in order to center it. I apologize for that error, let's try again. Perfect, game paused, game resumed, 
game paused, game resumed. All right, guys, so we are actually done with our game. I'm really happy that we have done this together, guys. And as I promised you, I'm going to show you how to deploy this game actually on Netlify. So let's go ahead, create a Git repository. So let's do git init, right? Um, git add everything. So we're going to add all of the um, game file, git commit, and that's the initial commit for the game, right? So, okay. Now let's do uh, git branch m main. And let me go to my um, GitHub. So GitHub. And here I'm going to create new repository. Repository name, snake game. All right, let's do back brace snake game. This is a retro snake game uh, from Nokia 3310 era coded in JavaScript. Create repository. Then I'm going to copy this, get remote, add origin. And finally, we're going to push the code git push. Um, let's do it like that. You origin, uh, origin main. Great, now let's go ahead and refresh our page. I'm going to leave the link to this GitHub repository in the description below. Now to deploy our game, we will need to link that to Netlify. So do Netlify and here I'm going to log in. So this is Netlify guys, um, you can create your own account, you can link Netlify to GitHub and whatever the commits that you push to your GitHub repo, that's going to be updated automatically on your web app or site or game or whatever. So let's go ahead and create a new project. To do that, you will um, hit on add new site, import a new existing project, and you can see that you can import that from uh, GitHub, GitLab, and other sources. So I'm going to import an existing project, deploy with GitHub, That's confirming the authorization. Now you can search your repo. So um, you can search for your project. Let's do back brace snake. And this is our repo. Okay, good. Branch to deploy main. You want to ignore all of that. Publish directory, build command, base directory. Okay. And go ahead and deploy back brace snake game. Right, so you can see here that site deploy in progress. It has a very crazy name. We can change that in site configuration. We can go to uh, change site name and I'm going to call our game retro snake Nokia dot Netlify dot app. So we're going to save that. Years ago, you haven't had the chance to change your site's name, by the way. You would stuck with whatever name they generate to you. And this, it was crazy, honestly. And you can see it gives you a preview or a thumbnail of your game. So uh, we can click on that and boom, retrosnakenokia.netlify.app. Let's start the game. And yeah, perfect. Everything is working perfectly. Game over, final score six. So there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for watching the whole thing. If you like this video, please leave a like and please let me know in the comment section below if you want to see more games coding, I would gladly do it. I really enjoyed coding this for you, explaining everything from A to Z. Thank you so much one more time and I will see you in the next video. Till then, stay safe and be well. See you later, guys.